Okay, so this is the final lecture for the course. Uh, and this is going to look at parts of chapters 13, 14, and 15. So we're going to look at the evidence for evolution. We're going to look at speciation and extinction, and then the overall origins of life. Um, you know, these learning outcomes here, these are what you sort of focus on from the chapters of the book. So clues to evolution lie in the Earth's body structures and molecules, and life arose about 4 billion years ago, 3.8 billion years ago. Uh, and changes in body structures and molecules have slowly accumulated through that time, producing a variety of organisms that we see today. And below here, you can see a little timeline of um, the different uh, eons and errors that have existed. So what are some clues? Well, the biggest clues, and I'm sure most of you are familiar with these, are fossils. These are remains of ancient organisms, and these are things that we have been able to identify, classify, uh, and then even uh, characterize and characterize the differences between, um, you know, current species uh, and more uh, historical species or ancient organisms. So fossils can form in many ways. Um, you know, it could either be by compression. Uh, it can also be by petrification. Um, you know, uh, impressions uh, or castings. Um, you know, these are sort of the different types of fossils um, that have formed over many different years. And we also look at anatomical relationships, which oftentimes can reveal common descents. So if you have two structures that are homologous, if the similarities between them uh, reflect a common ancestry. All these animals, for example, have similar bones in their forelimbs. Okay, so that would be an anatomical relationship. And then what you would do is you would sort of look, how are they different between the different types of species? And once you identify how they're different, then the next question would be, why are they different? Well, they might be different because, you know, for example, one needs to fly, one walks on all fours, uh, one walks on both legs and upright. So, you know, there's different uh, adaptations that have occurred depending on the particular species. Also, embryonic development patterns provide evolutionary clues as well. So if you look at an adult fish, mice, and alligators, they have very different bodies. Um, however, their evolutionary relationships are more obvious during embryonic development. As you can see here, the embryonic development of a fish versus a mouse versus an alligator, they look very similar. Homeotic genes will control an organism's development. Small differences in gene expression might make the difference between a limb and a limbless organism. So as far as on the genetic side of things, it might not actually be that much of a huge change, but what you ultimately end up seeing um, as the final result is a huge change. So comparing DNA and protein sequences determines evolutionary relationships in unprecedented detail. And since the discovery of DNA and then since the ability to sequence DNA uh, and subsequently uh, protein sequences, um, we have been able to take pretty much all species of life that we have characterized and do uh, DNA analysis on them. And we can see and track the evolutionary, evolution, uh, evolutionary changes with, within the DNA. So if we look at one example, uh, here we can see molecules can also reveal relatedness. Cytochrome C is a mitochondrial protein that is often used in molecular comparisons. The more amino acid differences between species, the more distance they are from the common ancestor. So here, if we look, we can see a chimpanzee, uh, and uh, this is our, say, common ancestor. And as you can see, the number of amino acids difference in cytochrome C from humans, um, you know, for chimpanzees, it's, there's none. For the rhesus monkey, there's one. Uh, and then you get all the way down to yeast, which is, 
which used to make bread, uh, it's a microorganism, uh, there's 40, okay? Uh, so, you know, the further you get away uh, from the common ancestor, uh, you know, the more changes you'll see. Okay, now let's talk about speciation and extinction. So mutations are the raw material for evolution. When you change the DNA sequence, and that change leads to a change in a protein sequence, this is how you start to evolve and change things. The DNA nucleotide changes can alter how proteins function or how they are expressed, creating new phenotypes. Phenotypes, again, uh, I think I was mentioned this in the prior chapter, are the expressed uh, version of the genotype. So evolution produces life's diversity. Small evolutionary changes that accumulate in a population are called microevolution. These can occur quickly in just a few generations. Eventually, this leads to macroevolution, which is slower and results from large scale changes. In evolution, new species form while others become extinct. Species are distinct groups of organisms, but the definition of species has changed over time. The use of DNA analysis has helped to define species. Prior to DNA analysis, classification of species was based on characteristics, you know, physical characteristics that can be observed. DNA analysis is taking away those physical characteristics and kind of looking at the raw material, looking at what is the sequences that make up this organism. So researchers will compare the nucleotide sequence of genes that organisms have in common. In bacteria and archaea, if the DNA of two organisms is more than 97% identical, they are considered the same species. There are countless small evolutionary changes that have accumulated through the last 3.8 billion years, leading to today's great diversity of life. And this is sort of what we call the tree of life here, where you have the domain bacteria, the domain archaea, and then the domain eukarya. And when this was initially sort of classified this tree, it again was based off of all the characteristics. This tree has been adjusted and sort of really either changed or supported by the you know, DNA analysis. So how do small mutations, even if numerous, produce new species? First, we must explore what defines a species. And there are three domains, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. In the 1700s, Carolus Linnaeus defined species by appearance. He also created a naming scheme for species. Each species name combines the broader classification genus with the term with the term species. The scientific name for humans, for example, is Homo, which is a genus, and sapiens, which is a species. More recently, the biological species concepts define species based on their potential to interbreed and produce a fertile offspring. Speciation is the formation of new species, which occurs when some individuals can no longer interbreed with the rest of the group. If the potential to interbreed defines the species, reproductive isolation results in the new species. So the development of new species could be the migration of a group to a new area. Mutations help to differentiate one population into distinct groups. The exploitation of new niches by a group from a population. Okay, so now we talk about species. Let's talk about uh, the origin and histories of life. Early Earth was not a hospitable place for life. Uh, geology and astronomy studies tell us that the Earth and other planets in our solar system formed about 4.6 billion years ago. Pressure and temperature were too high on planet at the time to sustain life. For about 500 million years, the harsh conditions on Earth made it possible for small molecules to combine with each other. And scientists think this is how the biological macromolecules formed in sort of this big, huge chemical soup. And you started to 
mix all of these various uh, elements and eventually led up to starting to form what we now know as our macromolecules, which would include things like lipids, uh, sugars, carbohydrates, uh, third, nucleotides, and fourth, amino acids, as you can see in this diagram here. So Miller tested the hypothesis. The Miller experiment simulated Earth early atmosphere properties. It showed that in a simulated earthly Earth, early Earth, sorry, environment, simple molecules can combine into organic compounds. So he essentially created in a closed environment what Earth was like and had the elements there and showed that they were able to sort of form these macromolecules. Other prebiotic simulations also have backed up Miller's results. More recent experiments mimic the conditions in the hydrothermal vents where high temperatures and pressure allow for organic compounds to form. The first RNA molecules may also have formed on clay surfaces. RNA is a self-replicating molecule. Once it formed and replicated, natural selection took over. Staple molecules that could self-replicate became more and more common. An RNA, RNA world may have gotten life started. RNA is a self-replicating molecule. Oh, sorry. Um, membranes also started to enclose these molecules. Uh, phospholipids naturally arrange themselves into a bilayer because of their properties. Uh, what happens is the hydrophobic tails are going to bury themselves in the middle here. And these polar or hydrophilic heads will be on the aqueous environments. Some of the self-replicating RNA molecules became enclosed in these phospholipid bilayers. The first cells on Earth lived without oxygen. They probably used organic molecules to obtain both carbon and energy. And they oftentimes would have probably undergone a process of photosynthesis. As we sort of uh, progressed uh, and a lot of these photosynthetic organisms started to make their way to land, uh, we started to use some of what available oxygen there was. And you can continue to see from about one and a half billion years to one billion years ago where animals, fungi, plants, protists, archaea, and bacteria all seem to have emerged. Bacteria and archaea evolved, which used light for energy and atmospheric CO2 as the carbon source. This was about three and a half billion years ago, and this process is photosynthesis. With photosynthesis occurring, this changed the air because photosynthesis levels of CO2 began to decrease, and that also allowed for oxygen to increase, uh, which led us to the ability of these organisms uh, that then use oxygen to sort of uh, take shape and um, start to develop about 2 billion years ago.